Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode three of Intellectual Interlude. It's a, uh, a smaller contingent this week than ordinary, so it's just myself, David. I'm the treasurer of the Derbyshire branch of the British Science Association, and with me is, as usual, Ian. I'm the uh, secretary. For the <laughs> very British excited. Science. I am very excited. I'm Ian. Hey. Yeah. So I, yeah, I'm the secretary of the British Science Association for the Derbyshire branch. So just us today. So we've got Dream Team back. Uh, and yeah. on top of that, the last two weeks we've suggested it a weekly podcast. But since the last one, which was two weeks ago, which was two weeks after the first one. Um, we've decided to make them bi-weekly because that's that's sort of the that's pattern that's happening anyway. Are. So yes, they're going to be bi-weekly and so that's every other week rather than two a week. And hopefully that means the content that we um, provide is, isn't is rushed because obviously if we do one every week, that's a lot of time. So we can we can be a bit more more free and open to talk about some awesome subjects. Of yes, science. brings up some more news as well. Yes, so. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome subjects of science, like I said it. <laughs> So yes, let's kick off today with your story. Yay! So in the world of technology, I'm moving away from space. I think in in episode one I did Tim Peake's Return, didn't I? Yes. And in episode and two I did, did Juno. Juno. So I'm moving away from my trend of space. I mean, I only have two data points to compare this one to, but <laughs> even so. Into technology, more specifically digital storage devices, which doesn't sound particularly exciting, but it will. So, so Ian, you know how a hard drive works. Do you know how a hard drive works? Roughly. Roughly. So with a standard hard drive, what you get is um, a disc, which is called a platter. And on top of that, there's an articulated arm, which means it moves backwards and forwards. So then as the disc spins, it can find all of the space on the disc. Yes. And when you, in school, did you ever do that thing where you magnetise like a, a, a nail, an iron nail, and it stays magnetised until you un, until you demagnetise it? It's something we did at school. Yes. I went to school a long time ago. That's a bit, un- <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit old technology. Maybe you didn't do that. But that's a, similar situa- that's a similar scenario to what happens in a hard drive. So as the disc spins, well, on, on, on the platter, on the disc, there are billions and billions of tiny little areas that can be individually magnetised and demagnetised. So if, an, if one of those areas is magnetized, it registers as a one in the binary code. And if it's demagnetized, it registers as a zero on the, on the, um, in the binary code. Therefore, you get a sequence of ones and zeros. And it writes the information circularly in lots of concentric circles as you move towards the center. Um, one of the limitations is that the articulated arm can only move so fast and the, the platter disc can only spin so fast. Okay. And to load up a particular program or a particular game or something, the disc has to get up to full speed because it's not always at full speed. And the articulated arm has to position itself so it reads the bits of information that it needs through your CPU. So the, so the disc has to, has to be able to spin. So the limitations are is disc spin and arm efficiency in order yes. to get to where it needs to. Yeah. So and we, we, the, there will never be a high enough RPM in the disk um, to match. Essentially, there is there's a millis, there's the the delay in reading information and writing information onto a platter in a hard drive um, can be measured in milliseconds, whereas the latency within the CPU can be measured in nanoseconds. Okay. And there's what is there? A, so there's a million nanoseconds to a millisecond, if I've read that out correctly. So yes. So, so there's quite there's quite a disparity. So. Very- that's very your much hard the drive can, factor. Your hard drive can never work as fast as your computer wants to work in terms of writing and reading information from the hard drive. One of the new technologies is solid state drives, which is rather than using magnetization in a binary fashion to provide ones and zeros, it uses um, electrons to either to, to change the charge. I don't fully understand it, but it's called a float gate, and electrons will move into it to negatively charge it and move out of it to positively charge it or, or neutralize it, I guess, because it can't positively charge it. I guess, I guess in, it's already in, in that way, it's a very negative charge or a not as negative charge, similar to transfer in nerves, in that there's a positive and negative. Oh, yeah. But in calcium, reality, yeah. they're both the same orientation. It's just one is higher charged than the other. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. So it says it, so electrons are stored in the floating gate, which is this, I don't know, it's arbitrary to me, I don't know what it is, it's just the name of something because I've done the research, <laughs> um, which then reads the charge as zero or one, so there okay. are two states it can be in, and that, and it's the actual, it's actually the opposite to hard drives, so with hard drives, demagnetized it reads as a zero, magnetized reads as a one, which is logical, but in this, um, not charged reads as a one, and charged reads as a zero. Okay. Um, but this, it still provides a binary state. But that can work incredibly fast and much faster than hard drives. But this is where the interesting piece of information 
So <laughs> I've been working towards. Go on. Just to jump back to that. Uh -huh. So I believe that they're called solid state drives because they don't actually have any moving There's parts. There's no moving parts. So, so they don't have that so limitation, don't have the limitation of actually moving through Which is space. why they're faster exactly. and therefore preferred if you have the budget for it. Yeah, they're preferred in terms of writing and reading, but in terms of erasing and rewriting information, they're incredibly slow. Okay. So yeah, the piece of the interesting piece of news from the week that I've been working towards this whole time. <laughs> da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Thanks. A group of scientists have worked out a, a new method that they they they've proved in terms of the concept works using chlorine atoms on a copper surface. They evaporate the chlorine atoms onto this copper surface, um, and they arrange in like groups and each group is a bit and it's basically like a grid like a chess grid and the individual atom is either in an up position or a down position and depend that so it has two possible states which then is means it can be read as either a one or a zero so that binary. Goes back to binary yeah which is the computer code that all computers read so this has changed it from magnetized and demagnetized yes. to electron positivity and charge to actually positioning atoms yes that's crazy it is and their proof of concept was a one kilobyte piece of information that they stored using this particular method okay on an incredibly small um scale in terms of physical space that think what's the stat it was um you could store the entirety of books ever written on a drive the size of a postage stamp using this method that is which colossal. is incredible considering the current size limitations we have yeah. That is quite the same. So it's up. about the size of an SD card. So which how, is what you put into your camera at home. How big a storage was that? I remember you saying that there was a storage per square inch. Yeah, so it's five hundred terabytes or terabits per square inch. That's crazy high that's incredibly high yes but the interesting thing is <laughs> it's, it's quite poetic but the the one kilobyte piece of information that they've recorded onto this concept was actually richard Feynman's famous quote um i, I didn't know about it i'm not a physicist but he gave this particular talk on december 29th 1959 at the annual meeting of the american physical society and it was first published in caltech engineering and science and caltech is the californian institute of technology in california in the united states of america <laughs> this is really clever so i'll read a bit of the quote it's quite long i'll just read a bit of it but it says i am not afraid to consider the final question as to whether ultimately in the great future we can arrange the atoms the way we want the very atoms all the way down what would happen if we could arrange the atoms one by one the way we want them in brackets within reason of course <laughs> You can't put them so that they are chemically unstable, for example. Um, up to now, we have been content to dig in the ground to find minerals. We can heat them, we can do things on a large scale with them, and we hope we can get a pure substance with just so much impurity and so on. But we must always accept some atomic arrangement that nature gives us. We haven't got anything, say, with a checkerboard arrangement. With the impurity atoms exactly arranged 1,000 anstroms apart or in some other particular pattern. So he said it in 1959, and then this week, these scientists released their data to show that they've in concept, as a concept, moving atom by moving atom. atom, atom by atom, using an incredibly, incredibly pointy sharp needle that can move atoms Singular atoms they're sharp, to their different positions. They're sharp, and then there's being able to move singular, singular atoms. atoms sharp. Exactly, yes. Now, there are limitations to this technology, of course, as it's only a concept. I keep, keep saying that word concept. That means it's not practical to be used at the moment. So Richard Feynman alluded to the fact that we can't obviously keep them in an unstable state. And whilst they're not naturally found in a checkerboard pattern on copper, in positions of ones and zeros, which is completely unnatural. Yeah, there are. In order to keep them stable in those positions, we have to. Uh, well, those scientists in particular, not me, <laughs> had to store them at 196 degrees minus 196 degrees C, which is 77 degrees Kelvin, which is cold. incredibly cold. Like really cold. Yeah, like you have to have specialist equipment and not be in there. But like I have a specialist freezer for my work, and it goes down to negative eighty. And that's <laughs> that's over double that. Over double that, yeah. And the single write and read process, so the, the the speed that it writes the information isn't on the scale of kilobytes per second like you might get from a hard drive or an SSD drive. It's on the scale of minutes. So they did a kilobyte, and it took them a number of minutes. <laughs> it's not hey, practical. Not practical for doing day-to-day -day stuff on a computer. Not really, no. Possibly, as a proof of concept... Possibly and, practical at the moment to do long-term backing up to. 
For example, if we wanted to or felt the need to back up digitally every book ever, it would take a long time to put onto a, a hard drive it would be f- at, at that speed. But in terms of you could still store it well. Yeah. Well, I don't think it's practical because we'd have to store that in a room that's minus 196 degrees C. But it only has to be a little room. And I think people can write books faster than this device, than this story that's system a very good can point. write books. <laughs> That's a very good point. Yes, we, there's probably so much information being produced that you can't actually back it up fast. Keep up at that speed, no. But so the interesting two. thing is not necessarily this particular storage device, it's that we can now write things um, in terms of atom by atom. So either this method will be improved to the point where it is practical, or somebody else will use the findings from this to make a practical application for it somewhere else. Yeah. Not necessarily into digital storage. They might find quite another... Possibly. another. No, the ability to move atom by atom could be utilised in quite a few places. Yeah, well, immediately I'm thinking medicine. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's fantastic. Well, from the positively minute to the large... <laughs> I couldn't think of anything. That was a fantastic segment. <laughs> we had that pre-planned and everything. So, uh, Sorry, go on. So, yes... Moving on to the very, very large, I'm going to talk about ecosystems, specifically about a study that was recently done looking at how biodiversity has been affected on a global scale. So, there's a couple of things we need to cover before we get to this. Hey, Ian. Hey. What's biodiversity? What's biodiversity? (laughs) That is one of the things we need to cover. Okay. So, biodiversity is basically the variety of organisms you have in an area. So uh, this is this isn't just animals. It isn't just plants. It's all all of them because that's what creates an ecosystem. So an ecosystem is both involved. It actually involves natural or biotic and abiotic factors in an ecosystem that sort of construct what it is. But in terms of biodiversity, you just look at the biotic side of things. But it is all bacterial life or animal life, or plant life or archaic life. It's all of these factors and the and the distribution of how many of which species appear. And this maps it. So in general, having a larger biodiversity is better because you have more of a chance to fill more niches or niches, depending on where you are. But we'll come back to niches and niches in a bit. So the other thing that we have to talk about is biomes. Hey, Ian, what is biome? (laughs) I'm glad you asked that. (laughs) So so a biome is a group of plants and animals that exist in a particular composition that can be replicated or that is replicated in similar environments. For example, tropical rainforests are a type of biome because you can tell the types of plants and the types of animals. Not like they're not the same species by species as you go, but there are similar niches available within them. I came back to niches. I guess we should probably talk about niches a little bit as I keep relying on them in my definitions. Mm. So yeah, a biome is just basically a pattern in nature that occurs because of certain environmental characteristics. So a niche for an organism is a job or a role that it fills in its environment. It's a gap in the market. Yes, a gap in the market. A good one is, or an easy one to describe, is a lion. A lion has filled the niche of top predator in its place. Apex it is, predator. yes, referred to as apex predator. Yeah, it's, it's king of the savanna. It is top of the food chain. That's what it does. There are lots of different ways to classify biomes and who calls what or who says what is a biome, what isn't a biome and what biomes are lumped together and what aren't varies. But the study that we're looking at has uh, used the WWF regime with the World Wildlife Fund, not the wrestling (laughs) organisation from the 90s. Uh, Yes. (laughs) So there are 14 biomes in that this uh, classification ranging from... uh, Tropical and subtropical moist broadleaf forests, all the way down to uh, mangroves and tundra. So it covers everything. That's the aim. So, to the research. So this was led by a researcher called uh, Dr. Tim Newbold, and he works out of the University College London, which is a very prestigious university. And so what they have found is that 58% of the world's terrestrial surface, so the land, is currently below the recommended threshold of safe biodiversity. So 58% is quite a lot. Yeah. Like a majority. Yeah. That's how percentage works. <laughs> so this study this study was actually really quite robust. They used a massive data set. The data set they used covered 2.3 million records 
covering 39,400 species living in 18,600 sites. Do you know what you need for that? To hold all of that information? <laughs> A really good digital storage system. Ooh, throwback. <laughs> yeah. Yes, these findings were published in Science, a very, very prestigious journal. Journal. So, uh, so yeah, this data set is colossal. It like is having, impressive. So it was a, uh, it was an international collaborative effort. It would have to be. using <laughs> lots of data from lots of places that has that has put it together, and then it was modelled by the researchers at CSIRO to uh, map how biodiversity every square kilometre on the globe has changed since humans have colonized it. The CSIRO is the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization. So they are an organization, I believe, based in Australia that basically do a lot of work towards the environmental effects and improving ecosystems and life as it is. So th does that mean Commonwealth is in the Commonwealth? I think so, as it's related to Australia. Yeah, a lot of information. Like you, you've got deserts in Australia, you've got well, deserts in India and tropical regions in India. We've got obviously the um, temperate zone here in the United Kingdom. Yes, we, and then we, we spread quite a lot of the... Uh, and then there's alpines and, and um, alpine forests in Canada. Yes. So the, they've uh, got a, a good cross-section. They used to be British the Empire, Empire probably yeah. covered most types of biomes there. Yeah. Are. So the reasons I brought up biomes earlier is the most affected were the grasslands, savannas and shrublands, which one can make a fairly good deduction is because that's where all the farms are. Yeah, that makes sense. If you're going to be able to grow grass, it's great for plants. You look at that, you go, OK, so things are growing there. How about I take all of that stuff away and I put my yes. carrots down? So, so the problem or one of the supposed problems in terms of biodiversity is when you farm, you cut down lots of species, like if you're in a meadow, like a grassland. Yeah. You've got lots of wildflowers, wild grasses, bushes, shrubs, all of these, and you cut them all away and you turn it into a monoculture. So there is just your carrots, like yeah. you said. So this means that in terms of diseases, they spread quickly. In terms of niches available in this ecosystem, there are now much less or much fewer because you've now only got one predominant species of plant that can only support X amount of invertebrate life and can only support X amount of bacterial life. And because there's only so much bacteria in invertebrates, it can only support so much bird life and yeah. herbivory. And therefore, the and it, it has knock-on effects all the way up. Well, we live in quite a, an, an urban area, but we only have to drive 20 minutes and we're out in um, what's known as the Peak District, which is a very kind of natural environment. And it would have quite a high biodiversity because yeah. it's been left natural. But around that, and basically anywhere in the UK, if you ever fly over the UK or any kind of temperate region, like anywhere over Europe or, or Northern Europe, you'll just see farmland for miles and miles and miles. And I imagine that's... I've always said that. I, 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 I don't understand people who like to live in those environments. I've, I've never liked the look of farmland because there is zero, bio, there's zero biodiversity. It is 100% man-made. Yes, it's apart from your hedgerow here there's, and there. There's very few. So hedges are very important in, in farmland. Yeah. Slight tangent. Hedges are very important in farmland because they allow biological corridors in between areas that aren't man messed with. So if you've got a bit of woodland that's rescued over here, and then you've got hedges in between the fields all the way to the next bit of woodland, then in theory, wildlife have a uh, have a safe bit to a. Uh, walk through and travel through in order to get to the next bit yeah. it also provides habitat for birds and insects and things and enriches the amount of species that are available so yes that is important so it said 58 percent of the globe was below the threshold so this threshold that they're going off of was a guideline set up that said if an environment or if an ecosystem or a biome has 90% or lower of the life it had before humans came in, then it's below the threshold. Okay, so if you it have has to lose above 10% of the biodiversity yes, so only, to yes, so it's only the 10% loss that is that starts to ring alarm bells, at least in terms of this predictive yeah, model. Yeah. So globally, biodiversity is down to 84.6% of what it was. Oh, that's, so that is below the threshold below globally. The threshold globally. That's interesting. See, one thing I was thinking of is they say 58% of Earth's surface is now below the safe level for biodiversity. Yes. And they estimate 86%. But 
t typically, so they're looking at the anth anthropomorphic effect. So humans, are, the human effect. Yes, once humans settle an area. Heavily. If you consider how much is inaccessible or completely useless to humans, most of the rainforests, well, the rainforests in kind of Africa and in Southeast Asia are, a lot of it is inaccessible. The Amazon, um, well, apart from Borneo, Borneo has been torn down. But <laughs> um, in the Amazon, yeah, yeah. it's being used more and more for monoculture, uh, like farmland. Stuff, yes. Um, and being torn down hectares, hectares at a time. But still, it's incredibly large and vastly in inaccessible. Plus, it's like mountain ranges that covers a large percentage of the land mass. That is inaccessible the, uh, and useless. And the deserts and polar caps, they're useless. We can't grow anything there. We can't put, well, apart, people try and, and, and a lot of places succeed to put cities in those places. But um, it's Quite. nowhere near as densely populated yes. with humans as very more resource temperate intensive. regions. Yeah, so if you exclude those zones, then how much? Then what percentage of the useful land in inverted mm. commons have mm. we ruined? Uh, yes, <laughs> have, it's a very interesting the, point because they make a point to say that actually uh, the tropical areas also have quite a large uh, have had quite a large drop. Yeah, in comparison, not as badly affected as these. Uh, as does the that have a and grasslands, does but. that have a bias to it though? Because if you so for instance the jungles of like amazon and, and africa and southeast asia mm. i don't know this outright but i'm thinking that they're probably going to be incredibly diverse or before humans came around they would have been incredibly diverse yes it's so likely they had a higher biodiversity there's, to start there's with more things to go wrong you see what i mean quite possibly so human impact human um human impact on those areas is going to have potentially a more of a a shotgun effect to um, the biodiversity quite quite possibly though you can also argue it the other way around in the because there are fewer jobs if you lose in the less biodiverse places if you knock off a few of just them, a few of them then yeah. it's a larger percentage. but if there's fewer jobs so fewer um, niches to fill therefore fewer macroorganisms like animals and stuff just just for hypothetically yeah. speaking then where was i going with that in <laughs> i don't know well the way I was oh yeah going i was going to say there's going to be there's if there's less um, biodiversity to the point where it's so few that only losing a small amount of it constitutes the 10%, then it's easier to uh, avoid that disturbance. It's easier to avoid it, but it might have a larger effect if it, yeah. that niche is running an entire element of yeah, that's true. nutrient cycle or pollination or food production. or like These are yeah. all the main things. That's so the biggest problem with biodiversity loss, so we'll get to the, the sort of, uh, not criticisms, but the, the cautions of this paper, is that the problem with biodiversity is we know that biodiversity affects ecosystem and biome function. Yes. It's very hard to predict what that effect will be because there's so many factors that play a role and there's so many species and there's so many jobs that other species have that are reliant on each other that it's very hard to actually predict what will happen. For example, with niches, if you lose one species, it could ruin an entire ecosystem or its neighbour could take its role. Yeah. And therefore you could be mostly fine or you could be in a real deep water all of a sudden. So it's very hard to actually work with this has happened and you go, so what does that mean? And everyone sort of goes, well, we're not really sure. I suppose loss of biodiversity is how niches arrive anyway. Yes. So they have all. So, so there is. There's always been ice ages that obliterate biomes, and then new ones and the appear, new, and new niches and new species, new niches come back, and different species fill niches to the ones that were there before, potentially. So yeah, I mean, there's potentially three effects: a negative, a neutral, and a positive effect of biodiversity. But it being man-made, I suppose, is, is the problem. Yeah. Um, so so the uh, so the largest caution is is while it. It's basically, the biggest caution is it's an indicator, not a prediction. So while there was a massive amount of data used, more local data needs to be relied on for each of these places. So basically, way more studies need to be conducted before we have a better idea of the big picture. Yeah. But that's not to say that this study isn't fantastic and a great eye-opener into, into this problem. Exactly, yeah. No, I, I like this study. Yes, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, um, it's, good it's informative. Like as, it. as normal, we'll be posting the links to these articles. Yeah, we'll post all in, the links. In the description, and you'll be able to click on them. I followed the uh, link to the abstract of the paper that was published and looked up some of the other things as well that so, is yeah, quite easy to learn from. Um, again, if, if any feedback is welcome, 
um, for this episode or any other episode, um, you might start seeing some, because we're going to go bi-weekly, you might start seeing some reminders midway through that period for the previous podcast, just in case you didn't see it the first time. On, on top of that, you can also find us on Twitter, um, Facebook, and I'm sure we'll pop up on other platforms eventually. Yes, it will just be a case of getting those sorted. If you've got anything that you want to tweet at us, um, any new stories you want us to talk about, just any, any feedback about the podcast, you're absolutely welcome to. Yes. We encourage it. Yes, it would be it would be great to hear. Or if, yeah, like David said, if there's something you'd like to be spoken about or mentioned or something that you yourself has found interesting that you feel like we didn't mention this week, send it over. We'd love to read it. Here's a radical thought. If you'd like to be on the podcast, why not tweet us and we can see if we can make that happen? Yes, very true. Awesome. Okay, so thank you very much for listening and this has been The Intellectual Interlude. Goodbye.